Welcome back to Asset TV's View from the Floor. I'm Jillian Kemmerer, joined by Tim Anderson, Managing Director at TJM Investments. Tim, always a pleasure to have you on Asset TV. Oh, Jillian, it's great to talk to you today. So I think we're going to start with some of the big news that's got everyone a little bit riled up, which is the downgrade of the New York Community Bank. Are you looking at it as a bellwether, something similar to March of last year, or an isolated incident? I think it's largely an isolated incident. Now, that being said, it's very likely, to the extent that their real estate portfolio is the main catalyst for their dividend cut and their downgrade and the stock being down 60%, and we really don't have a lot of those answers, but I'm sure there are a lot of other local and community banks that have real estate issues that may suffer from them a little bit, hopefully not to the extent that NYCB is, and it doesn't seem yet like there's a tremendous amount of collateral damage among a banks or other financial institutions that have counterparty risk with NYCB uh, specifically. We just need to, this is a fluid situation, and we need to keep an eye on it, but Right now, I think it's 80 to 90 percent an isolated incident. Now, you mentioned to me that the S&P was hovering around that 5,000 mark today, but the market's weighing a lot of factors. What are they? Well, look, we've had a very strong move uh, so far this year. We're, about, we're almost in the midpoint of the first quarter, and, we're, and we had a very strong move off the lows right at the uh, end of October, early November. Now. There's a big debate as to has mega cap tech just had too much of a parabolic move? Is there too much hype around AI? Look, the earnings from these stocks have been phenomenal. But at some point in time, some investors are going to say enough is enough. And they're going to, if they have outsized gains in some of these names, they're going to trim a little bit. And, there's, and, and, and certainly it would be healthy for some of these stocks to consolidate these gains that they've had, uh, not only in the last six weeks, but since uh, uh, the midpoint of the fourth quarter. Uh, but that's not to say that they can't go higher. And I think that that's a big talking point for the market. And obviously, if those stocks were to stall, at least stall a little bit, maybe have a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of consolidation or a mini correction, where would the leadership and the rest of the market come from? Now, we've seen several members of the Federal Reserve coming out and sort of walking back the conversation around rate cuts, certainly not canceling the notion of rate cuts, but maybe tamping down on the market ebullience. You said it's a very choreographed dance. What are you expecting from the market if, let's say, we don't see cuts starting in March and the number that the market has predicted, which has really outpaced the Fed? It's, it's been astounding to the extent that the, the, the Fed Fund futures contract, which is very, very heavily followed and has at times in the past been very accurate, has looked for such an aggressive pace of rate cutting. And I think it's coming back more in line with the Fed. And I think the thing with, I, I think the Fed's mes message is really, it, it's not about whether or not we're going to cut rates. It's really just the timing. And... And, and, and to that, I think it doesn't really, for the market, it doesn't really matter if they cut in March or if they cut in, the first cut is in March or in May. And I think it would be much more likely to see three, maybe four rate cuts this year, rather than the six or eight that had been uh, forecast by these Fed Fund futures contracts uh, as recently as in the, the fourth quarter. I think that was too aggressive. Uh, and the Fed has basically said that, I think what was very encouraging about what the Fed said at the last meeting was, we don't need better inflation data. We just need more of what we've seen over the last four to six months. We need to see that for another few months to get comfortable that the progress we've seen is going to stick. Okay, well, Look, a few months from now, we'll be at May. And that would, that would very possibly be the first rate cut. And I don't want to get too wonky into the, the math part of it, 
But once we get into May, then some of the very high inflation months that are still in part of the 12-month moving average will roll off. And just if we get steady to what we've had over the last few months, that, that annualized rate will go down from 2.7 to 2.9 to 2.6 or 5. And the Fed will be able to say, okay, we can see it now. It's right around the corner. You know, we, we, we might not get to 2.0, but we're going to get to the low twos. That'll justify their first cut. As you've pointed out, and as we've heard ad infinitum, the Fed is data dependent. And as you said, they're looking for more inflation data. But what other data points will you be watching for in the coming weeks to give us a sense of where we're headed? Well, certainly any of the CPI data, any of the more uh, uh, personal consumption expenditures, the the PCE data, which has always been the Fed's favorite data stream, and then uh, any more detailed information on consumer spending, on on, on, on retail spending, and on uh, uh, just any component that would go into the inflation picture, maybe even on housing. And housing will be important because it's the much less transactional than energy or food. So it's going to be the last leg of the stool, so to speak, to show real improvement on the inflation front. Well, Tim, thank you so much for sharing with us what you're keeping an eye on. And we'll look forward to catching up with you a little later in the year. Well, it's always great to speak with you. And thank you for tuning in. From the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, I'm Jillian Kemmerer for Asset TV.